This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living Catholic, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother and the parish of Sacred Heart in Oklahoma City. And today we need to talk about modern times. I know this is an endless topic, especially for us older folk. Just saying modern times reminds me of my grandmother I used to stay with when I was a kid. She was born at the turn of the 20th century here in Oklahoma, when it was still normal to farm with mules and to sleep outside under the stars on a straw tick when the cousins came in to spend the weekend. She was always amazed and disappointed with modern times. Maybe it's true that the older you become, the more you imitate those who make your life. Whatever is the case, it will be for these next few minutes, I will become my grandmother. And the best way to talk about modern times is to tell you a couple of experiences I've had. Get this, ordering pizza. I'm not somebody who orders pizza a lot. In fact, I almost never do, which may account for the difficulties I've had doing it. Be that as it may, let me tell you of two incidents concerning this very simple process. I mention this because when you think about it, there's not that much to it. I mean, it used to be you could call up, tell somebody what you want, they'd fix it, you pay for it, then you carry it home. Certainly, we're not talking about brain surgery here. But in this interchange, there's always room for friction. Something may be misunderstood. There may be a chance for a mistake about time or price or, or simply the problem of any process of communication. Plus, there are always differing sets of expectations between those who are selling and those who are buying. Those who sell pizzas want to sell more pizzas. Those who buy them usually are concerned with the one pizza they're getting right then, which sets in motion the potential for misunderstanding, if only in the fact that the arrows of intentionality are heading in different directions. My first story took place about 10 years ago here in Oklahoma City. I went into a pizza place, one of the international franchises, and ordered a pizza. The guy, the guy behind the counter took my order, reaffirmed what I'd asked for, and then rang me up. No problem. I pulled the cash out of my pocket, and he asked me, what's your telephone number? Well, I paused for a second because there was no real need for me to give him my number. I don't mind giving it, but I didn't want to give it to this octopus of an organization who would use the information for their own purposes, including selling it and whatever other information they could garner from it. So for a moment, I thought I'd give him the number I had when I lived in Chicago. He could input that on his register, and that would be it. But I realized that wouldn't really address the concern, which is that this exchange was of something more than cash for a pizza, and all I wanted was the pizza. He wanted something else. So I responded, you don't need my telephone number. And he said, well, I need it in order to give you your pizza. And I said, you're not giving me a pizza. I'm paying for it, standing here while you make it. And when I get it, I'm going to take it home. And he said, again, I need your telephone number. By then, I'd arched my back up and said, no. And he said, no number, no pizza. So I did the only logical thing. I left. In fact, I went down the street two blocks to another international franchise and got a pizza from them and went home. I have to admit, the second pizza was inferior to the one that would have been made at the first establishment. But such is the price of integrity, I guess. It was a startling moment for me because I realized at the moment that the company had trained this employee in the notion that they had stopped selling pizzas and had started selling information. Without getting my information, they weren't interested in selling their product. In fact, the product with their business had changed from satisfying a customer's taste to extracting a customer's profile. I know it was a simple thing with a particularly clueless employee who was, by the way, not a high school student trying to make a little extra cash, but a guy of about 40 who seemed to know what he was doing. But I found it startling. I was watching the world change before my eyes. These days, with the internet becoming ubiquitous in every exchange, the information harvesting is exponentially more than it was even a decade ago, like in that exchange. One of the commentators I heard put it this way, the internet is free because you're the product. 
the gigantic infrastructure of the Internet with its communication packets, its acres of servers and computer hardware, with the underlying investment worldwide of trillions of dollars and sustained by the annual providing of billions of dollars of software and hardware is all provided because it makes money for those who invest in it. It's not particularly evil. Making the Internet accessible to everyone is something like a major grocery store chain buying land for a parking lot and then uh, when they build the store. They know it's not just the store and its merchandise they have to provide for. They have to provide a place for the customers to park in order for them to get there. Investing in the land and the concrete is simply part of doing business. Skip it and there won't be any customers. Internet availability is something like that. Of course, it's also more than that. We are the product. Those who put the web together make fantastic amounts of money by marketing the information they harvest from all of us who make use of this modern thoroughfare. By observing what we want and how we look for what we want, the marketers and advertisers and retailers know how to respond. We're the product even when all we do is open our browsers, click on one of the icons, and look for whatever delightful morsel is there for us. It may be God who counted every hair on your head, but it's Google and Meta and Yahoo that has counted, stored, analyzed, sold the information on every stroke, swipe, and touch or command of yours. The internet was developed to be survival, a survival communications platform in case of nuclear war. It was designed to enable the government and its entities to communicate with one another during the disruptions sure to happen with bombs going off and the, their damage wreaking havoc on the phone system. Technical details are numbing in their cleverness and intricacy. Suffice it to say, it was a brilliant idea and was brought about with lots of brilliant engineering. And should, we should remember it's only been around in the way we understand it now for not quite 30 years. I still remember the first time I saw someone go online. And I remember the first time I looked something up on my web browser. And of course, I remember what life was like without automatic access to information and communication like we have now. All that being said, what would break the Internet? What would break this system designed to survive a full-scale nuclear exchange and accomplish its purposes in the face of war spasm? Money would break the Internet. Well, to be, to be more precise, the lack of money would cause everything Internet-associated to come apart. Without profits, without the possibility of making money from it, the Internet as we know it would disappear tomorrow. All the convenience, all the immediacy, all the information assembled and dispersed would all end if the right entities weren't making the money they wanted to make. We think of it as everywhere, as basically free and as one of the backbones of our LinkedIn civilization. We also think of it as robust and simple. But all its attributes would change overnight if the companies who had invested in it went bust. Think about that. The next time someone wants, to, wants a little bit of information from you, you're the product. In 2021, I was flying to Rome to begin my sabbatical. At the airport here in Oklahoma City, I went to the screen at the flight counter, put in my name and reservation number, and the computer told me there was no reservation. I had all the information on my phone. I wasn't traveling as a matter of life and death, so I wasn't upset. I just knew there had to be some problem with accessing the information. It was a slow day, and the person behind the counter asked me what the problem was. So I told him. He put in my name and the information I had, and then looked at his com computer screen, and then he told me to input a series of numbers on the screen in front of me. Now, in the old days, meaning about 10 years ago, he would simply have checked me in. Instead, he provided me with the information about how I should check it, how I should complete my own check-in. It seemed odd. He was doing his work so I could do the work that replaced his work, and all of that in the name of convenience. I have a suspicion there's a lot more to it than convenience. While I was in the midst of trying to check in, a couple came to the counter, carrying the old-style suitcases without wheels and wearing dresses and sport coats. They didn't look like they traveled much, and they said, we'd like to buy a ticket to Nashville. From behind the counter, the attendant said, we don't sell tickets here. You have to go online and buy a ticket there. That's the only way to get a flight. Think about that for a moment. According to this attendant, at the airline counter, 
They're not interested in selling you transportation. You can't walk in and buy, apparently for any amount of money, what the airline sells. Do any of us take note of what's happened in our world? Oh, also, as a part of my flight to Rome, I was required to fill out a 15-page questionnaire concerning my COVID status, which, by the way, no one ever looked at. I didn't have time to do that at the counter, so the attendant said I should simply take a picture of the website information, and when I was through security, I could fill it out while waiting at the gate. So I asked her what would happen if I chose to travel without a smartphone. She simply shrugged her shoulders and said, I guess you couldn't travel. Imagine that. A cell phone with the capacity for internet access, photography, and all of the other capacities we've come to expect. They've been around for what, 15 years? Now it's basically required in order to travel. I remember when there was one computer on the campus of OSU in the basement of the math building, and we all lined up to type out our programs on punch cards at the punch machines the size of player pianos. Now we have exponentially larger computer power in our pockets as we carry around a billion transistor machine in, uh, with us all the time, which we need in order to find our airline ticket and get on board a plane to Nashville. Modern times. My second pizza experience comes just a few days ago. I got online and found a pizza place not far from where I lived. Now, the fact I've been at Sacred Heart for a year and a half and just now started looking for a place to get pizza should give you some idea of how important this is for me. But the fact is, I did go online. I found a place. I did click on the icon to order a pizza. It was pretty simple, except I had to navigate all the options for not getting the pizza I want, for getting the pizza I wanted, including not signing up for a Gmail account and not providing a password and not affirming that I wanted to get updates about everything. But when I finally finished, I provided the payment information and waited for the message that I was promised about when I could go and pick it up. And in a moment, ding, I received the message. Show up at 8.22 p.m. at the pizza place address and the pizza would be ready all easy. It was all the promise modern instantaneous communication could offer. Well, other than I did all the work of communicating, which we never seem to notice in this kind of exchange, the middleman is eliminated by putting all the work on us, which seems to be a particularly bad deal for us. But that's for another time. Into the cold, out to the car, up to the store, into the shop. I arrived at 8.25 p.m. No pizza. They were puzzled. I showed them the message, and they affirmed to their surprise that I had showed up at the right location and at the right time. And they affirmed, yes, indeed, I had gotten a message to come and pick up what I had ordered. But they also affirmed there was no pizza. I was irate. The guy behind the counter called the manager. She looked at my phone again, looked at her computer, walked over to the kitchen, checked the tags on the pizza boxes all stacked up there, and then came over and handed me a menu. Which pizza did you order, she asked. I was flummoxed. How could this happen, I asked her. I have a message on my phone that the pizza is ready. I come here, and there's nothing. Oh, she said, that message is from our IT department. That's why she said the subtext is, it's not our fault. We just make pizzas, and we didn't make yours. Now, we'll see about making the one you ordered. And by the way, there was no, I'm sorry we messed up. How about having this on us? Or, I hope we can do better next time. Or anything like that. It was the IT department. Again, I asked, how do you do this? One of the guys behind the bar came over and said, look, there's no reason to be irate. We're all doing the best we can. You can be better than that. Well, that infuriated me. If for no other reason, no one in the whole place accepted any responsibility for anything. It's the machine that messed up, not them, not anyone. So I said, you took my money. You told me to be here. You told me the pizza's ready. I'm here and there's nothing. You did this. We had a contract you didn't observe and you didn't observe your part of the contract. I'm out in the cold with nothing. You can do better than this. He left. After a few minutes, the manager came over with another order somebody was waiting on. I know that because she told me. She gave it to me and she said, I hope this is okay. Again, no offer to make right on their mistake, no apologies for not getting things right, and no interest in, my, what, in what might have gone wrong. 
I know what went wrong. Well, I don't know what the problem there is in their interface with the computer in the kitchen. And I don't know why a message got sent to me that was false. That's something that belongs to the complications of this age. The problem is that they have no sense of responsibility for what happens in their place. No one who works there is actually empowered to do anything other than to read the screen and do what it says. And certainly there was no sense of ownership in what the manager was doing. It literally did not matter to her that my experience was less than satisfactory. Her job at the end was to get me out of her establishment without anyone else hearing what I had to say. The system is designed to keep mistakes from happening, and it eliminates the employee who answers the phone and writes the order and presents the options from the sizable menu. By eliminating this one worker who gets a salary, who gets Social Security, who gets days off, who comes late once in a while and maybe can quit in the middle of a shift, when that person is eliminated, things work more smoothly. That is, when the disembodied process proceeds as it is designed and everything goes according to plan. But the process is not just disembodied, so is the product. There was no real interaction with the customer, me, as a customer. The interaction was handling a problem when it came up. The manager was there to handle me. I didn't ask for my money back because I was afraid I'd find out the answer. I didn't ask for my money back because I was fairly certain she wouldn't even be able to give it to me. I'd paid over the phone and the IT department, which could have been in Cleveland or Taiwan or Moscow for all I know, and for all the difference it makes, wasn't in a cooperative mood when it came to accessing data, obviously. I did get my pizza in the end, but only grudgingly and only after a brief lecture on why I should lower my standards getting what I paid for. It was an unsatisfactory interchange. Our IT department wasn't working. That's the best I got. That's like renting a car, having it break down on the road, and then having the agency say, well, it was the mechanic department that didn't do its job. Which other car would you like to drive? The entire thing was disembodied, which is what we've come to expect. The interchange we have with even something as simple and straightforward as food at a restaurant has become machine-dominated with the human taken out of the process. Exchange of information is what computers do. It's what human interaction has become. We have become the shadow of the machines that operate around us. I used to joke with people that during the time of COVID, eventually we wouldn't be allowed even to come into restaurants and sit down and peruse the menu and then dine together. If we followed the trends of the moment, we'd have to go over the menu before we arrived order everything ahead of time, and then only be allowed into the restaurant to come to the table and eat. Needless to say, when eating was over, it would be time for us to get out. When there's only information to exchange, things like eating or enjoying the time together, what used to be called dining, go out the window. That's what we're coming to. Medical care, auto mechanics, even library services, they're all tempted to move in this direction. In many cases, they have moved in this direction. And what does this have to do with living Catholic? Two things, one minor, one major. The minor point is one made in the Psalms over and over, which is, we become what we adore. Those who place idols in their view and bow down to them become like them. Idols are blind and deaf and dumb. They can't see, hear, or speak. And those who are preoccupied by them and their power in their lives become them. We've decided there's nothing more powerful and nothing more meaningful in our lives than the power of our machines to hurry up our lives. We can exchange information and interact with one another's common sum of information in ways never before imagined. And in the process, we have become our machines. It seems to be the case that we are nothing much except the power to present facts to one another. Beyond that, we seem to be blind. Humanity has to be more than that. If we're not, we're subhuman, not superhuman. And the second, the major one, is that the life of the church is absolutely vital to the life of our humanity. As the world becomes more and more dehumanized, stripped bare of what we are to one another, what the church offers is the prospect of interchange and brotherhood. In another age, that didn't sound like much. In our age, it is revolutionary. 
The church exists in order to facilitate our relationships to one another. We are together as sons and daughters of the same father, and so we are brothers and sisters to one another. We don't exchange information. We encounter one another. For the most part, no one has thought that sitting next to somebody at Mass or sitting across the table at a funeral dinner or sharing a thought at a Bible study was some kind of grand strategy for recovering our humanity or refounding the presence of Christ among us. But it is. And not only that, we also exist as the human community that forbears and forgives. Our intersections with one another are at the most basic level of what it means to live and act and be. No one much thought we had a secret we could share with the world, but this is it. You can't be the church without the one-on-one, without the face-to-face of being with one another. The temptation to become efficient or to become anonymous is always with us. With the COVID interruption, when so many turned to their TVs to watch someone celebrate Mass far away and have stayed there, we saw what giving in might look like. But we all know, whatever we've done, it's only stopgap. Such a thing, that kind of disembodied encounter, has no future to sustain the church. We are given to one another to be for one another. There is no machine, no artificial intelligence, no question tree that can substitute for that. The future of the church lies in being who we are. That's what lies ahead for us. If we are who we are, we will transform the world. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to our final segment, Faith in Verse. We have a poem today called The Changing World. In our world, terrified of change, we complain a good deal about how things are. The clouds hang low, are too cold now. These threats allow our focus on the freezing stars. Then the monster of too much heat now, such that we protest and shout. Our lives are not the same. Our vigors wane as we look about. Convinced if only we could hang on, await the dawn, all would be best. Forgetting in the world changeable so, there's just no stopping and no final rest. Life is changing and living, is to be altered. Uh, Ideas mold and falter in their time. And change will come here too, all the future in due, so out of the depth we climb. Not to make our days impossible here, but draw near to promises made that life will ultimately endow all those about with great beauty in the shade. That's the changing world. living Catholic, we do strive to go beneath what we see every day in order to understand and to experience what the depth of the faith really is. I hope in the weeks to come that we can continue this journey together as we together are Living Catholic. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit OKCR.org.